Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and crystal guests aboard the ship. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Heyman, and I'm one of the destination lecturers for this part of the world cruise. Um, I'll give you my self-introduction, which is I'm a active duty merchant marine officer uh, holding a U.S. Coast Guard license, and for many years I've worked on various ships all around the world, and especially in Asia, where I first worked for nine years with uh, Lindblad, and then have been director of a shipping operation in China and all around Asia, which has brought me to Singapore many, many times, and also Malaysia and all our ongoing ports of call. And I'm very pleased to be back here in Singapore to uh, come back to one of my home ports, I would call it, where I have spent quite a bit of time. And every time I come back, I'm very surprised by the tremendous uh, growth and architecture of uh, Singapore in particular, and also Kuala Lumpur, where we're going next. So I'm going to give you an introduction to the geography and some of the background history of these uh, remarkable places so that you might enjoy them more. And I've called them the cities on the strait because they are the key cities on the Malaysia, uh, Malaysian peninsula facing the strait of Malacca, which is one of the great straits for navigation in the world. Uh, that is the symbol of the merlion of Singapore called the Lion City in its original Malay and uh, Tamil name. And uh, this is a symbol of the strength of this particular city right there on the very tip of the Malay Peninsula. As you can see on this uh, chart, Singapore is right at the beginning eastern approach to the Straits of Malacca, which then go up into the Indian Ocean. And Kuala Lumpur is just up in the um, inland about halfway up past the port of Malacca. Now this has always been a trading area with considerable commerce going back into ancient, perhaps even prehistoric times, and Singapore is very much at the very center of the commerce, the navigation, the trading houses, and then the different cultures that have come to mix here, which have made Singapore one of the leading international cities of the world. Now it is independent from the Federation of Malaysia, which I'll talk about a bit later. Singapore, being the main city in the area, uh, declared its independence when there was disputes with the newly independent Federation of M uh, Malaysia. And so it is the penultimate island city. And you can see that it is actually a, a, just a couple of islands and a few offshore pieces of land, but it's one of the world's smallest nations with only about 8 million people in it. But it is a powerhouse in technology, finance, and of course the shipping industry. And so most of it, where we are today, are down on the south coast of the Singapore island. Uh, Johor, which is this neighboring uh, Malaysian state, is joined by bridges and is very close. And so Singapore being in, the, in between Malaysia and then the vast uh, archipelago of Indonesia is in a very strategic and perhaps a, a pivotal sense in the history of this whole area. So here we are, just Singapore has different neighborhoods and actually very little left of any countryside because it has, as the city's grown, it has filled out the island. In fact, they were building more sand to build more islands. Um, but in the heart of the city, we are just to this off the chart at the cruise terminal. But you can see as you've been traveling around today, they have a tremendous financial center and a lot of parks, a lot of upland residential areas, a whole uh, area that is uh, electronics manufacturing, computer businesses, and the industry of high-tech industry, which has been the source of much of the uh, economy of Singapore. But if you come on a ship as you sail in, you see it like this, the um, skyline looming out of the sea with perhaps the greatest am amount of shipping in the world that is sitting and waiting for call. And it's what's called the roads of Singapore. Uh, in in na navigation terms, a road is a place you park a ship waiting for orders, sort of like a big parking place. And Singapore is ideal for it because it's in tropical waters, but because of the geography and the oceanography around here, there's never a typhoon or a cyclone, which are common in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, but Singapore is remarkably tranquil for weather, which is always good news for mariners. Now, when the first settlers came from wherever they came, populated the Malay Peninsula, 
what they call the Bamiputra, which are the original people. There's still remnants of some aboriginal people in the highlands, but essentially Chinese traders came and met the Indian traders and the Malay traders, and they made a port out of all of these little islands, and particularly the island of Singapore. This is one of the first British charts by a man named Hamilton in the early 1700s. And the trade that was with Asia all had to pass through the Straits of Malacca and had Singapore as an entrepot or a place you could offload and do commerce. And this led to the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and then the British finally came to claim commercial rights originally from the Sultan of Johor, and then uh, Sir Thomas Raffles set up the British East India Company post it in Singapore, which became one of the leading commercial centers for all of Southeast Asia. And his name continues on to this day with the um, Raffles Hotel, which perhaps some of you visited there, the classic uh, tropical uh, luxury site. That flag down on the lower uh, right hand, left hand side is the flag of the British East India Company, the great trading firm, um, which had, of course, the stripes represent their many territories. And uh, Raffles was impressed by this location geographically, and, and he lived the, all of his life here, and, and amongst his official duties, he, he in, uh, ended up writing the, the earliest uh, botanical and ethnographic accounts of the area for the uh, Royal Society and others that were course interested in this part of the world and this was a very difficult uh, environment particularly for the Europeans came it was jungly the currents and the rocks were perilous uh, there were many shipwrecks all through here so they absolutely had to depend upon the local knowledge just to get here and to get around and some of these early pictures of Singapore showed as the tropical jungle that it once was. Now I would call it a tropical garden because you have all of these luxuriant palms and uh, the great vastness of vegetation and previously animal life, let's say, on the island. And so some of these early postcards from Singapore always featured these remarkable palm trees and then again the local indigenous people, Malay and then Chinese traders and so when Singapore w was forced, exceeded as a trading post for the, for the British, this was a very much a dirt road and a, and a thatch hut environment, but it had already attracted traders and craftspeople and families from India, the upper Malay Peninsula. And so this led to it having f for quite a while a, a vibrant variety, a diverse society we now call it, where you have the Hindu religious rituals and then the Buddhists and the um, Muslims and everybody was here and they had a, a, it was not a theocracy though, it was a commercial center so everybody was allowed to live and uh, prosper under the order of the time of the British Empire with their Sikh police officers who were stationed all through Asia and the British uh, colonies at the time. But most of the commerce was handled by the various Chinese. And th that community has been always very important all through Southeast Asia, uh, being the commercial empire of the Chinese Empire. The Ming Dynasty in particular sent the great treasure fleets under Admiral Zheng He all the way through Indonesia, Malaysia, all the way to India and Africa, and left trading communities of Chinese which remain to this day. So. Singapore is actually majority ethnically Chinese, unlike just across the border in Malaysia. But you'll see all of these temples and remains of, let's say, the commercial families and clans of the Chinese working with the Malay and other peoples that would then be trading out of Singapore in boats like this. Now, this was before great mechanization, industrialization changed the face of not just Singapore, but the world. But it used to be very low buildings and then the anchorages just off the rough shore. Uh, th the British then improved the infrastructure, let's say, with d docks and then fortresses and various uh, buildings which are very evocative of the of the time of the British Empire, and then a bit of that remains up in Fort Channing, if anybody had the chance to go up the hills in central 
uh, Singapore off the downtown where there are graveyards to the original settlers. And then usually back then it was a one-way trip because it was so far, m a month or more at sea just to get to where you are and then perhaps move on. But rarely would people get home in those days. Uh, here's the grave of, uh, of a woman who died aboard a ship on the way here. And so that was the, tr the toil of uh, the past. They would, uh, the old saying is no, nobody would ever go to sea for a holiday. Otherwise, you could, uh, you could do worse only in hell. But um, Singapore, nonetheless, developed as a, in the 1800s, early 1900s, as a British bastion of the empire with its navy base and its fortifications uh, in case of problem. And of course, this did happen when the Japanese attacked 1942. And so this is a point of history that's sort of painful in Singapore because the the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy were here to defend uh, Singapore from the invading Japanese who had attacked Pearl Harbor already, but their real m motion was to come out of South China to come down the peninsula to take Singapore as a base to then take the oil fields of Indonesia. Now the, the Allies had, had made an uh, oil embargo on Japan and 1939, which is considered the trigger for the war, and the Japanese had nothing to lose. So they had their rapid attack on Malaysian Peninsula. They took Kuala Lumpur. They took Singapore, finally, even though that was defended. But they had air superiority. They bombed and sank a bunch of Royal Navy ships, including the Repulse, the large battle cruiser. And then the defenses of the city of Singapore uh, were mostly gained to the sea because they thought that the Japanese, if they attacked, would come by sea. They didn't expect them to come over the jungly trails of Malaysia on a bicycle um, assault and then surround the island, essentially. Um, and then General Arthur Percival to protect the residents of Singapore from either siege and or bombardment. Um, he thought that the Japanese were much stronger than they were, and the Japanese, I would say, fooled the British command in Singapore and then demanded a surrender and then imprisoned some 120,000 um, British allied and local people, executed all the police and marched off others to the death camps up in Burma. And so this was a very painful um, a loss for the British Empire and the Allied cause. And here's the surrender ceremonies in the main uh, courthouse with uh, General Yam Yamashita and General Percival. And uh, the, in, uh, in history, uh, military history, it's been said that the Percival, had he been more belligerent, might have held out longer, but actually it was inevitable because the Japanese Navy was streaming down and uh, Singapore would have been laid waste likely. But anyway, the Japanese came in and there was no great damage to the city. This is the general post office where they had the ceremony. But they, of course, mistreated the local people, the, uh, let's say, the pretense of the Japanese to make peace and prosperity in Asia without all the European colonies was given the lie to by their mistreatment of the local people and exploitation of resources, including the imprisonment of many Singapore people on the island of Sentosa, which is across from where we are docked right now. Uh, there's a museum of that period there if you have the stomach for it. But meanwhile, downtown there is this beautiful monument to the martyrs of the occupation and the resistance against the Japanese. Well, this led when the Japanese suddenly surrendered to Singapore being relatively intact. The um, Royal Navy came back in, but there was a strong movement among the people of Singapore. They did not want to be subject to the, uh, the, the fortunes of Great Britain, first of all, and then the isolation from the rest of Asia. So Lee Kuan Yew, who at the time had been a uh, young naval officer and had promoted with his People's Action Party the independence of Singapore, became the first prime minister, and his party led to the independence of Singapore. Now, this is a, 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 a kind of a curious point in history where a small island with a small population thinks that it can be independent from the larger powers of the world. But this has proven true, 
partly by geographic position, by also the canny and the wisdom of the local leadership that they would make peace and prosperity with all of their somewhat tumultuous neighbors at the time, Malaysia being the primary one. When the Malaysian Federation was formed in 1957 and, and Britain gave it its independence, Singapore was going to be included. But because of all the disputes among the parts of Malaysia and also the resentment that Singapore was a larger, richer city with a majority Chinese population, it led to the expulsion of Singapore because it would have been a dominant uh, factor in the politics of the peninsula. And so um, in, uh, Singapore became independent as had been promoted. And so now it is a let's say the smallest of all nations in Singapore, but it's in a strategic place in this great field of islands and seas and land masses. Uh, and uh, this, in, this chart is about piracy in the area, which I won't really go into, except it's been mostly suppressed by the local navies and cooperation between all the powers. But it used to be that the Straits of Malacca were f famously dangerous, and you could not go through there without an armed escort. I worked on ships out of Singapore many years ago. We always had machine gun toting um, security guards on the ship because on the, uh, in the off case where the fish weren't biting the local fishermen would prey on various vessels. Um, this is largely eliminated, but th this particular pirate uh, can't be all bad because he's a Yankees fan, even though he should be a Red Sox fan. Uh, anyway, But anyway, Singapore has prided itself on having extremely peaceful street life, uh, low corruption, high education, and a general sense of security, unlike some of its neighbors. And this is the symbol of the of the uh, the nation, and it's of course big new financial district. Uh, it does have a parliamentary form of government, but largely dominated by the People's Action Party that has repeatedly elected their own leadership out of the Lee Kuan Yew dynasty. His son is currently the prime minister, and so it has a um, somewhat of a dynastic sense within a parliamentary structure. And then the offices are still in the old British colonial building. So it has a great deal of uh, pomp and pride this way, and uh, then commercial success. Um, because of its favorable financial laws, stable legal systems, uh, com comparable to Hong Kong, but of course Hong Kong has been uh, ex uh, joined back in with the People's uh, Republic of China, leading to all kinds of conflicts. But Singapore is proudly independent and then unrelentlessly prosperous. And so you have towers rising behind this, in cases the old Anglican Cathedral downtown, um, which has been converted into a shopping mall, which is the fate of uh, some religions. And uh, so, so in, in just in downtown Singapore, in spite of the high rises, there's a pre preservation of certain buildings that are of, the, of an era and Singapore to its wisdom has not just torn everything down like you have in most other Asian cities. So you do have all of these, you see these uh, red tile roofs, those are all the, they call the shop houses. Those were commercial shops on the ground floor with a family living upstairs. And so this was what it was like before the modern era, also before air conditioning. So they all have high ceilings. You have promenade on the road that, uh, uh, rather covered archway, so in the rain, uh, you don't get all wet, and the climate here is predictably rainy in the afternoon. Then downtown, you have all of these different commercial areas, open markets, air-conditioned malls, and then different ethnic enclaves with um, their own festivals. So a lot of this is uh, either Chinese culture or Mal Malay culture or Indian Hindi culture, all of which are represented by temples and memorials. And it's remarkable how many people are sort of mixed together with contrasting uh, cultures, but they all seem to enjoy each other in Hong Kong most of the time. There's, there is competition, there's been some political conflict. But among all the, among the curiosities here, this was the, uh, the uh, Har pa, ha Par Villa founded by the Chinese doctor who started the tiger balm um, medicine. And so in, in his interest, he, he d developed a panoramic of sculptures to depict Chinese legendary characters, sort of like a uh, Dante's Inferno, but in a full diorama form, like a big museum. Uh, here's an Indian um, temple, the Sri Marahman Temple, a South 
Tamil style uh, temple. Um, others are even more elaborate with all of their Hindu gods. Uh, one of the great festivals here is Denali, the Festival of Light, the Hindu um, sort of New Year's gathering. And so this city has, a, particularly in the evening, is, is lit up and very um, colorful because in the day it gets kind of steamy. Uh, so people put, put out their entertainment out in the evening, of course. Here's more of the shop houses and uh, some of the old style noodle shops on the street have become modern kiosks where you can get these uh, old Changi uh, noodles and the Singapore uh, spice noodles is a famous dish you get all over the world now. And as in most, most of Asia, people be sent, or seem to be spending most of their time eating between various work. But even in Singapore, you even have Turkish outlets, kebabs, and a whole variety of culture. And the, the society becoming, uh, or rather being fundamentally diverse, uh, has to have some cohesion. And for the government of Singapore, that is education, it has one of the highest levels of educational literacy and also third uh, uh, tertiary degree university and graduate level education. And they have a saying here called Kai Su, which is the, your discipline of yourself to join and support the group. And this is taught to the kids from kindergarten up through the uh, university level where they have a, uh, a Confucian style emphasis on uh, cooperation and common goals. So this has led some people to say Singapore's a bit too much groupthink. People don't express their feelings and their most radical ideas lest they be shunned or else uh, put out of a job or other um, opportunities. But uh, nonetheless, uh, most people in Singapore are quite content that they live in a safe and a prosperous place because they just see the rest of the world in various difficulties and so you could say the real motto of uh, Singapore is uh, safety first in all the local languages. And this has led some people to say, well, look, Singapore is the ultimate nanny state. They're telling you can't do this, can't do that. You have to watch what you say. You cannot have the sense of uh, flagrant expression like you get in some other parts of the world. But um, And they, they still have corporal punishment. Famously, some foreigners were flogged for graffiti or minor offenses, but um, their draconian punishments for particularly drug dealings are lead to public hangings. And so th that's one of the problems around here. They live in a dangerous part of the world with a lot of trouble and they try to keep um, Singapore clean and healthy, including banning smoking. Well, I came across this notice, which is most curious. The public notice uh, this tele television program conflicts with our moral standards and the public is discouraged from viewing. And uh, this is a Fox uh, production of some uh, American whodunit or however it is. So all broadcast media must be passed by the Department for Appropriate Behavior, which is perhaps something that uh, uh, some other cities could uh, follow through, but uh, the, what it means is that they have a pretty squeaky clean reputation in almost all aspects in Singapore. The old sailors' brothels are gone and people have a much more uh, safe and prosperous life, including living in a very green city. So this is a uh, Singapore um, promotion of water quality, air quality. Um, and particularly the Singapore River used to be very polluted and full of debris from the activities. Now it's been cleaned up and made more of a lake because they built a dam at the face and then, then what were the old go-downs for the old junks that would be sailing around all of the islands and people living aboard and, and polluting the river have been turned into now day excursion boats, uh, river cruises, and the water, I wouldn't swim in it, but it's actually not that uh, polluted anymore because of modern sanitation. But you can see here all the old go-down um, uh, shop houses, and then behind there is the financial center. Um, some of the boats get a bit larger. This is a Chinese junk-style uh, excursion boat that goes out around the harbor. Uh, but above all of that rises this tremendous architecture of the new financial center. Here's a dragon boat race in the downtown 
uh, riverfront. Uh, this is the Kavanaugh Bridge across to the old General Post Office, which is now a luxury hotel. And uh, that, that bridge in particular was built in Scotland, brought over and assembled here. And it's now a historic uh, pedestrian bridge, but it says uh, uh, you cannot carry cattle and horses overladen on it. Well, those were the days. Now, now it's uh, uh, a highly modern city with a modern pr uh, transportation system, so there are no more horses in town. Uh, this is actually a sculpture on the riverfront of people, kids having a swim, but I wouldn't recommend it myself. Then there are new pedestrian bridges over the same river, which are quite fantastic, and decorated and uh, somewhat celebratory of what is a very much of a walking town. You can, if you stay downtown, you can walk all over and see a lot without having to travel very far. So these are some of the old warehouses along the river. Um, you have the key. Uh, Clark Key, which used to be a major uh, warehouse loading center now with these sort of big glass umbrellas covering the old buildings and making uh, uh, shops and eateries and things right down along the riverfront. Also, if you had a chance to go see the Asian Civilizations Museum, that's one of the leading uh, repositories of the various cultures of Asia that are there. And this again is the Raffles Hotel, which has been under various renovation, but it has a big new wing. But it has the uh, the old courtyard still in place, and uh, again cafes inside. But above all, they have the uh, the great bar where uh, the the beer is cold and the fans are over the s on the high ceilings. You can get your Singapore Sling, which is a bit of a sweet drink compared to the just the uh, the local Tiger beer. So Singapore has really grown, particularly in the financial services and banking uh, uh, industry, so that Singapore has become, let's say, a trading financing center for all of Southeast Asia in competition with uh, Hong Kong, but uh, much more uh, easier to do business and on a high index for uh, many factors of livability compared to other cities like Jakarta um, and others around Asia. But above all, they have all this tremendous new architecture, the big new hotels and observation decks, and of course the great Changi um, Airport, which is one of the most beautiful airports and most efficient in the world. Uh, this is uh, where most of it came and came out of, but it's such an easy airport to enjoy and to be around it. Uh, it's a model for the world, actually. And then other parts of the downtown have these fantastic uh, different uh, fountain of wealth the world's largest fountain, which is built uh, sort of uh, evocative of uh, Chinese coins and lights up at night. So this is a, this is a city of uh, many a modern wonder, especially their cultural arts center, which is this big dome, spiky uh, building, which has been called the durian, which is the local tropical fruit, which is like a big pineapple with thorns all over it. And so this building, um, houses the main theater for various cultural events, musical events, but the exterior is quite remarkable because it does uh, seem like a sort of a dinosaur of uh, its own uh, exterior, but it actually it's very light inside and quite a remarkable building on its own. But yeah, again, you can get everywhere just walking or taking a pedicab in a lot of these places. There are modern highways all over the place, but if you walk around downtown, you see a lot of people doing their Tai Chi in the morning and then enjoying the fresh air from the ocean. This is, uh, you can see here, out onto the harbor, the big new eye, uh, the flyer, I'm sorry, it's, not, it's like the London eye, except this is the biggest in Asia. And... Uh, one of the new, let's say, cultural entertainment uh, attractions for Singapore, particularly as they get so many people from around Asia and the world that come to see here, they build more and more monumental structures, um, particularly this, the great uh, Marina Resort and Hotel, which uh, was financed by Sheldon Adelson, the American casino magnate, on a 15-year uh, build-operate lease with the government of Singapore. And it features this uh, high towers with what looks like a ship that's stranded up on top of it. And uh, has the casino up there and an over uh, viewing platform, if maybe some of you went to see this. But it's really a remarkable building. But um, uh, many Singaporeans complain because they're not allowed to gamble. This is all for international tourists, especially Chinese come here to 
spend their well-gotten gains, but it's a remarkable piece of architecture with an infinity pool up there on the top of it. And I, I'm still marvel at how these things actually are built and how they stand up, except that in, in Singapore, again, there are no um, cyclones. There's no big tropical storms come here. There may be some monsoon rains, but all of, the, all of Singapore has a blessed climate for uh, its uh, place in the world. And they've been building more islands. They're so short on land, they've been importing sand to build and extend uh, more land out. This is the Marina District, uh, which has now become the large botanical gardens. They've been extending the docks out because they have more and more ships and they need more and more room for all of the infrastructure for this. And then the center city has gone up and up. So this is, uh, every year it's another site here. Now where we are right now, the cruise center, they have this uh, uh, resort island they call Sentosa. The old, uh, it was a originally just an off-island with some agricultural and vill vi uh, villagers, but now it's been turned into uh, gardens, beaches, museums. You go over by the funicular, which goes right over where we are, and then on to uh, the villas and facilities of Sentosa Island, which is not business. It's really the, uh, let's say, recreational facility for the whole city with again the merlion at the center, the symbol of Singapore, and many luscious gardens, many musical events and theater and uh, pleasures that are uh, much appreciated by the uh, Singapore people because they're often living in very small apartments and uh, cramped together in the neighborhoods on the north side of the of the downtown, but here they have plenty of room to take the kids and enjoy the uh, the delights of Sentosa. I stayed at a hotel there a number of years ago. I felt like I was not in not in a city at all out there on the beach. It's uh, just short distance right from where we are right now. One of the unusual things they built there is their own maritime museum, which preserves some of the old trading crafts and have models of some of the old larger great junks that used to sail all through these area, including the largest reproduction of the Zheng He's big junk from the early Ming Dynasty, early 1400s, which sailed right past here on its expeditions to India, Arabia, and Africa. So this is a symbol for the city that they would have such a heritage of large shipping that that is represented here in this maritime museum. And if they're uh, fountains and parks, they have a lot of uh, entertainment and fire and light shows and things like this. So Singapore is, uh, uh, again, uh, striving for th things that have never been seen and done before. And my favorite, though, is this new botanical garden that's been built on the Marina District, and particularly with these incredible lit structures which are now being grown with vines and lights and walkways. You can go and walk amongst these uh, structures that are now being covered over with the vegetation. And so this in itself is a destination just to go see this remarkable um, sculptural botanical garden. It also features the highest waterfall in any artificial setting in anywhere in the world. Uh, but it's uh, pleasantly air-conditioned, so you don't have to go out into the jungle to have that experience. So this is Singapore as... Raffles could not have imagined that it would become this big and this kind of futuristic, but that is the spirit of the Lion City, and it, uh, it is a welcoming beacon to uh, people around the world as we are here. And uh, at night, of course, it is a, a sp beautiful spectacle and a radiant center for commerce and culture in this part of the world. Now, I'll, I'm going to go on into uh, Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. And again, we are on the very tip of the sinuous Malay Peninsula, which stretches from larger Asia, Thailand, Burma, all the way down, a thousand more uh, miles down to Singapore. But you see the lower uh, sort of limb of the archipelago is the country of Malaysia. And it is along the Straits of Malacca, which again are... They're not very dramatic waters. You don't really see much except some low-lying land on either side. But this is one of the great um, constrictions in navigation, one of the 
internationally open straits. It may be within the territorial waters of Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore, but about one-third of the shipborne commerce in the world goes right past here, making Singapore and Malaysia a strategic uh, center for the world, in particular the shipping industry. So Kuala Lumpur is the capital of and the largest city of, of Malaysia. Uh, this is the flag of the city, uh, adaption of the Malaysian flag, which has the uh, Muslim symbol of the crescent moon, and then the federated states are represented by the stripes. Um, uh, Malaysia is about over half Malay indigenous people, about 15% Chinese people, uh, ethnically Chinese, and then we call the Bamiputra and other Indian smaller populations. Um, and in Kuala Lumpur, they are all, again, mixed together like Singapore, but it's uh, a very much a Malay-dominated culture. And Kuala Lumpur is there on the Straits of Malacca, just upland from it. And Malaysia does stretch all the way onto the island of Borneo uh, on the lower left-hand side. That's Sumatra, Indonesia, though. And so Malaysia is sort of a... a, a a country patched together with different uh, ethnic groups and geography as an inheritance from the uh, the British era. Uh, but it, until recently, was largely jungle with a lot of old growth jungle and then a lot of wildlife, including the Asian tiger and here's a pro proboscis monkey. They also had orangutans and all kinds of bird life and wildlife. A lot of that has been decimated by the for deforestation, the plantation of uh, palm oil. So there's very little left of the original forest and very little left of the wildlife. And the same is true now in Indonesia. It's one of the great losses of biodiversity the diversity is in this area of the world. And of course, that leads to a lot, a lot of different problems, especially for the humans eventually. But um, meanwhile, the Malaysian people have a sort of a vibrant culture on their own. This is uh, called uh, silat, which is a martial art that is sort of a dance and a gymnastics at the same time. And this was the duty of um, warriors and uh, noblemen, and even noble women, to learn how to do self-defense with their hands and fight directly. And so many of the legendary leaders of Malay uh, uh, civilization were masters of this, sort of like a kung fu that way. But there's also Malay culture is much more delicate. Let's say this is batik painting with wax colors and and dyeing onto textiles. Also, a national tradition is building these beautiful big ornamental kites, which is a symbol of the spirit of uh, the Malay people. Um, but Malaysia again is a diverse area where they have all these different languages and uh, ethnic groups uh, who are let's say, in federation, if not always in cooperation. But the population density is mostly around Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, the few other cities, and then on um, uh, Sabah and on the Borneo area, there's uh, some population, but it's that is still largely left either tribal or natural preserve. This is Mount Kin Kinabalu, which is the highest peak in all of Southeast Asia, and occasionally has snow on it in the midst of its uh, tropical... Um, environment. And uh, Malaysia is, uh, again, has uh, very strong ethnic uh, uh, elements. This is one of the great Chinese temples, Buddhist temple on the island of Penang, um, which is quite in contrast to what you find in uh, Borneo and Sabah and these other more um, naturalist areas. One of the problems is they've had terrible deforestation and then forest fires and then um, air pollution is spread all through here, including ha having health alerts in Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, over the burning of forests in Sumatra. So this is an ongoing ecological tr uh, tragedy that will unfortunately probably go on until there's nothing left. But back in history, and not even going that far, they, going back even a thousand years, there were uh, Muslim sultanates that settled the Malay Peninsula, converted the local population somewhat, and created trading posts on the Straits of Malacca. This is the Malaccan Sultan's Palace right on the shores of just up from Singapore going to the port of Kuala Lumpur. And uh, th uh, this is in Malaysian history, uh, the survivor of many conflicts between different sultanates and local peoples fighting in many ways. But one of the national heroes is, is uh, Hung 
Artois, who was a uh, magical young man who learned the martial arts and defeated many enemies and wooed princesses and then gave up his life in honor to serve a sultan of the time. And he is sort of the national superhero legend and his story is uh, illustrated on walls of the National Museum and he has a, a mosque and a temple devoted to him near Malacca and a tomb. So when we visit this part of the world, we don't really appreciate how long these cultures have been, how intricate or, or developed they are. And what, when we can visit here, we get just a taste of it. But there's actually so much that happened right here that the local people know, but we probably won't even notice. But if you go to Malacca on the way to Kuala Lumpur, you'll see the remains of fortresses built by the Portuguese who came here in 1511 with uh, Vasco da Gama, then the Duke of Albuquerque, and set up a Portuguese trading post. And he conquered the local sultan by subterfuge and then established this fort uh, on the shore of the old trading post with the P Portuguese royal symbol on it. And this was held until 1609 when the Dutch attacked and then they took over Malacca and the control of the Straits, made commercial arrangements with not just the Malay Peninsula but all through Indonesia of course. Uh, and then later when tin was discovered in the Malaysian highlands, this became a larger industry that led to the whole canning industry in uh, the, around the world and Malaysia was one of the largest sources and still is to this day. And this meant that Kuala Lumpur up from Malacca up into the highlands became the trading center for the tin miners which were mostly owned by Chinese uh, merchants but the workers were Malay. And this is what Kuala Lumpur looked like in the 1880s and before the British came in and started to develop it as a railhead for the tin mines. And so you can see down and coming down through central Kuala Lumpur, the, the railroad and then the beginning of the, the train station and other com um, uh, colonial era uh, buildings. And then there was always a, a British uh, legation and a uh, representations for the businesses and such as illustrated by this cricket team in 1895. And so the British came in as sort of a uh, overlording presence, but they always let the local sultans uh, have their local authority, and so this was very much a um, cooperative um, empire, let's say, because you have uh, the, for instance, the Sultan of Sang Selangor, and this is his palace, and it's still there in downtown Kuala Lumpur. The Federation of Malaysia actually trades the uh, presidency between the 13 different states that are federated into Malaysia, and they are often appointed by the local sultans who are a hereditary royalty, even though, again, Malaysia, like Singapore, has a parliamentary government. Um, and, and then it has its ethnic differences uh, here's one of the Chinese theaters in downtown Kuala Lumpur back in the 1920s. Uh, when the Japanese invaded, they came quickly down the peninsula. They took uh, Kuala Lumpur without much fighting. Uh, the British had ret retreated to Singapore by that time. And so, um, uh, again, uh, Malaysia then, after the war and after the decolonization, felt that it had to be independent, had to have its own... Uh, uh, place in Asia without being a colony. So, but you still see some of the old style architecture. Now Kuala Lumpur is a very large metropolitan sort of a sprawl. It has about 8 million people as much as Singapore Island itself. But again it has all these shop houses and uh, uh, high rise development, uh, um, walking market areas. Um, and in just this picture you sort of see the jumble of cultures with Arabic, Malay, a little Italian, a little this, a little Indian, and so uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, even compared to the rest of Malaysia, is a very mixed city, and again a major commercial center. It is a, a capital of the government, except they've moved some of the offices to a larger uh, buildings in a new um, capital called uh, uh, Patajura. But this is the center of Kuala Lumpur, and the, the name actually means the confluence of the rivers. This is the point where the trading posts were first built. And you can see uh, below all of the forest of new buildings, that little mosque right there in the park. Uh, this is the central mosque for the people of Kuala Lumpur. And again, the majority Muslim and let's say a fairly peaceful population that way. Uh, and uh, But the city has a lot of bustle. Now this is the Sultan's Palace next to, again, 
uh, commercial roads and now there's no more real quiet in the city because it's become a big traffic jam like most of Asia. And, but you can get around. They do have uh, modern transport and this is a city that is priding itself on its modernization and development of the country. Again, industry, uh, various industries along with mining, along with the agriculture and uh, the strategic uh, position that Malaysia has meant that there's a great deal of prosperity in Malaysia. It's become one of the most prosperous nations of all of Asia after Singapore, at least Southeast Asia. And so, um, in some ways, it's a big jumble of a city. It doesn't have a seafront, does not have, a, let's say, the waterfront uh, beaches like Singapore, but it, it's a very bustling place with many um, international businesses. And again, here's a view with all of the jumble of cultures that is typical of Kuala Lumpur and other parts of Asia now. Again, uh, Chinatown and uh, you know, the whole variety of Asia is there on the street and in the markets. And you can get around even uh, quicker because uh, uh, there's modern transport. Now, we're actually docking at the port of uh, Klang, it's called, on the Klang River, where we will be at an industrial port. And then it's an hour or more by bus into Kuala Lumpur, where most of the attractions are, like the big uh, shopping malls. And the, this is a city of let's say, uh, practice stupendousness. They try to be bigger and, and more modern than the next here. And, and again, they emphasize education and a certain discipline of the population. The, the former premier, Mohammed Mahathir, was the greatest proponent of Asian values and the importance of cooperation and prosperity. The current prime minister is uh, Najib Razak, uh, who um, is uh, sort of a leader of a political party which is, um, let's say, highly nationalist and to the point where he has been accused of embezzling vast sums, including being uh, brought to some inve investigations around the world now for money laundering, essentially. And he, he just is now currently promoting a law to ban any, uh, what he calls, fake news, especially about him. And so uh, as a leader of Malaysia, he's trying to make sure that his his uh, alliances and his commerce will, let's say, be, be beneficial for the country no, no matter who he does business with. But anyway, Kuala Lumpur is again a booming Asian city with its attractions, uh, particularly it has its uh, modern architecture. Again, it's almost like a great competition all around the world. This is the airport. And uh, here's the uh, Malaysian Telecom Tower. And now this is going to say these are the sort of modern temples of commerce these days, the broadcast tower. And so Kuala Lumpur in its uh, capital city way is trying to be bigger and brighter than uh, almost anybody else and mostly uh, known for the great Petronas towers, which are the double tower of the National Petroleum Com Company. And uh, again, at night is the time to see much of this in the cool of the evening and enjoy this uh, fantastic sight that they have for us when we come to see this part of the world. I'll just leave you with one phrase, which is Jalan Jalan, which means let's get going to Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. And I hope you have a great visit there. Thank you very much and see you all aboard.